We're very pleased to be able to make this video for you, for yourself, or for a study group that may be meeting with you in your home. This will not be an exhaustive uh, attempt on my part to look at all aspects of the teaching that embraces the concept of Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm going to give an overview of four basic subjects to give you some idea of what it is we say when we're doing a seminar or having a retreat or a, or a full week conference somewhere. Before beginning, however, let me call your attention to a book that Union Life Ministries has published called The Mystery of the Gospel. Let me read something to you. Paul clearly teaches that there are two aspects to the good news. To proclaim the saving gospel to those who are without Christ and to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Our ministry is basically dedicated to the second proposition, to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In preparing this book, several people have had a hand in it, and we've, we really want to recommend it to you, because we think for a, a study booklet or for for a book for you to have in your own possession where you get your own liberty and your own time schedule, read and study, you'll get a, an added idea of what it is we'll be trying to say to you on this tape. Uh, you can get these by ordering them from Union Life Ministries, and I know there'll be uh, more uh, information given to you on this uh, later on on the tape. I just want to call it to your attention because it will complement what I'll be trying to share, what I will be sharing with you on this video cassette. Now, the mystery of the gospel. I said the mystery of the gospel is primarily what Union Life Ministries is concerned with. We feel a definite commission of the Holy Spirit to bring to the attention of the body of Christ, the church, this neglected aspect of Paul's teaching. All evangelicals are acquainted with the theological truth, Christ died for us. However, not too many evangelicals are acquainted with the reality of the life of Christ present within them, being lived out through them and as them. Most of us that are a part of Union Life Ministries uh, come from that evangelical background ourselves. And we come from a life of knowing Christ died for us, but from then, we come from a life of a struggle. No law, no concept of victory. Everything being uh, partial or incomplete. Uh, uh, we, we often said, uh, well, what, there's got to be more than this. You know, maybe you yourself have said that. There's got to be more than this. And when the, the Holy Spirit revealed to us the reality of the mystery of the gospel, which Paul says in Colossians 1.27, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We were to use the phrase liberated. Liberated from the bondage of what we ought to do, what we ought not to do. Liberated from the bondage of trying to keep the law, the biblical law, our individual church law, the law we might have placed upon ourselves. We were just freed. And I recognize as I make that statement, we were freed, that it has, it can be so misconceived in some people's minds uh, because the idea of freedom, the idea of liberty is, is just a, a little more than they can handle within the context of their Christian life. They want parameters, they want rules, they want regulations. Of course, what we discover is we can't keep the rules, we can't live up to the regulations, but we want them. And it's, it's an insidious type of disease, you might say. It's an insidious type of a problem that here we want something that really can't do for us what we would like for it to do, but we don't want to be turned completely loose just to live in the freedom of the Spirit. Now, on this tape, we'll be discussing four subjects. The uh, first, I've given them names just for my own benefit, and I'll pass those along to you. I call them the line and uh, the cross. Those will be our first two subjects. And then we'll be discussing the swing and the life. I hope you have a Bible with you. 
And if you're having a study group, I hope not only do you have your Bibles with you, but as scriptures are used or as they are written down on the chalkboard that you'll take those down so that you can have them for study later on. Now, many of these scriptures you will be finding in the book, The Mystery of the Gospel, which I mentioned to you before. Now, the first thing we want to be talking about, as I said earlier, is this idea of the line. And I would ask you to turn in the Bible with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 18. Let me read. We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are seen are temporary. We look at the things that are not seen, the things that are not seen are eternal. Now, why the line? I use the line primarily as a teaching tool because there isn't any such thing as a line. This spiritual realm, this eternal realm that Paul is discussing or will be discussing or I'll be discussing goes on all the time. It goes on in the realm of the seen and temporal. But just so that we can separate these ideas and keep them apart, I just simply draw the line. I tell people you'll never forget the line because it has become a very clear and understandable teaching tool. Now, there are two important groupings of words, right? There's the unseen and the eternal, which we put above the line. And then there's the seen and the temporal, which we put below the line. Now, you and I live in the seen and temporal realm. All of our life is conducted here. Not only are things temporal in this realm, but they are material, they are uh, incomplete, they are fragmented, it's, uh, a, it's a realm bound by time, like uh, past, present, and future, uh, like the uh, words uh, sowing, growing, reaping, like the words uh, birth, life, death. That, those words describe this realm. Like I say, this is where we live. Something else about this realm. We know, from biblically speaking, that it had a beginning. And we know that the Bible teaches us someday this realm will come to a cessation. But in between here is what the Bible calls this age. Paul calls this, this age. Something else about this realm. You and I had a beginning here. Somewhere in this time, we had a beginning and we will also have an end. Something else about this. There was a time in this realm when we had a Christian beginning. We were saved. We were saved. So this, this realm has, for us, several beginning points. The beginning of the age. The beginning of my personal existence. The beginning of my Christian life. The end of my personal existence. And as far as the scene and temporal realm is concerned, the end of my Christian life, then the end of this age. Okay? Now, back to Paul's writing to the Corinthians. Look with me in the uh, second chapter of 1 Corinthians. Second chapter of 1 Corinthians. Beginning with the sixth verse, Paul says this. Uh, we might say that in the first paragraph, first five verses, he has talked with the people about what the situation was when he first came to them to present them the gospel. And it's kind of like we were saying as we looked on, uh, as I read to you from the back page of uh, the mystery of the gospel, Christ dying for us. Paul said when he first came to the people of Corinth, he came to present to them Jesus Christ dying for them. But beginning with verse 6, he changes his Emphasis. He says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age. Well, what is this age? We were talking about it just a minute ago. This age, 
between the outside lines. This created time, in the beginning God created, and there'll be a time when this created age is over. That's this age to Paul. And what he tells the people is that he, is, he doesn't speak to them about the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age. His wisdom is coming from another source. His wisdom is coming from the unseen and the eternal realm. And we had another name for that realm just a little while ago. We called it mystery. Mystery. Well, all of us are acquainted with the word mystery, and if we like mysteries, we like to read mystery novels. We know that a mystery means that something is hidden, but later it's to be revealed. Now, it... In the mystery of the gospel, Paul is telling us that there are truths that have been hidden that were waiting to be revealed in this age and to this age, but that had not yet been revealed, and so they were unknowns. They're mysteries because they're unknown, but they're not to be remain, they're not to remain as unknowns. Now, what are some of those mysteries? I think of one that we're probably all very familiar with. It's the mystery that Paul saw when he, when he saw that the gospel was for Gentiles. It wasn't just for Jews. It was for Gentiles. Now, why was that a mystery? Because the, the Jewish community hadn't known that to be true. Paul hadn't thought that to be true. In fact, he, didn't, he, he had no place with Jesus Christ at all, but one of the first revelations that Paul had had was that this good news of Jesus Christ is for the Gentiles. Second mystery, and the one we're going to be discussing, is the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, Paul says in another place that this was a mystery that had been hidden from ages and from generations, but now is being revealed. Now, that statement was made approximately 2,000 years ago. And we're looking at Paul's discussion of it in 1 Corinthians 2. He says, I don't speak the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, but we speak the wisdom which is hidden, hidden because it's unseen, hidden because it's mystery, but whose time has come. And then he says, God has revealed these mysteries to us. Paul's the speaker, so that's who the us is, Paul and his traveling companions. He has reveal these mysteries to us in order that we might be the agents or the means by which they reveal to you. Now, what do these mysteries involve? Paul says in verse 10, they, in, they involve the deep things of God. So we're looking together at, on this video cassette at what we could, would call the deep things of God, the unseen and the eternal truths of God, the mysteries of God. Now, for a moment, let's look at this realm. It's without beginning and without end, so no lines up here. This realm doesn't know time as we were describing time earlier, past, present, and future. Uh, birth, life, death, sowing, growing, reaping. If we had to pick a word, and it's a fairly common word among in Christian circles, to describe this age, we would just say, now. This is the age called now. It doesn't have a past, it doesn't have a present, it doesn't have a future. To God, things are now. Another thing that we can see from the words we put on the blackboard, we have the word temporal. We have the word eternal. Now, think with me. Both these realms are realities. But to Paul, and I hope to us, one of these realms is more important than the other. See, temporal and eternal. That means to me that this eternal realm is more important than this temporal realm. And yet, and this to me is a uh, background to the tragedy as we were saying, this neglected truth in the evangelical world of Christ in you, the hope of glory, that if this realm is never revealed to me, then I am locked in 
you might even say doomed, to live my entire existence in the seen and temporal realm. An illustration. And probably you have encountered this, uh, this experience yourself. Take a person who's not a Christian. Their life is entirely in this realm. You might have had a time with one of these people when you wanted to share Christ with them. Now, their response to you might have been something like this. I don't believe that. To me, all there is is this life. Just this life. I was born by some kind of accident. I'm going to live a certain number of years. I'm going to die, and that will be the end. That is a person who lives entirely in the seen and temporal realm. There is no such thing as life outside of the seen and temporal. And we say about a person like that, how tragic, how tragic. But that's not a description of us, so let's move on. A description of us, if not presently true, but it was probably true at some time in the past, a description of us would be, would be this. We came to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And we understood that he died for us and that our sins were forgiven. So that part of the unseen and the eternal and the realm of mystery became known to us. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean by that that the Holy Spirit convinced you and me so strongly that our sins had been forgiven that we had the, the courage, or the faith, you might say, but also courage, to go around and say to former friends, maybe, who were Christian, I'm now saved. I am saved. And that person would look at you, maybe, and say, well, hmm, what right do you have to say that? You still look the same to me. And even if they're a very critical person, they might say to you, well, I still see some things in your life I saw before, and you say you're saved. But because the Holy Spirit has so strongly convinced you of that truth, you will come back and say, yes, I, I am saved. Now, what does that mean? That means that you, in the seen and temporal realm as a human being, have encountered Jesus Christ not just on the seen and temporal level where he would be considered a master teacher or a worker of miracles or a good man or the ideal man or the man that everyone ought to copy, but you have embraced this Jesus Christ not on the seen and temporal realm but on the unseen and the eternal realm where the Holy Spirit has said to you, this is the Son of God. This is God's only begotten. This was Jesus born of the Spirit. This is Jesus, the Lamb of God. This is the one who takes away the sin of the world. And you have moved beyond the human Jesus to embrace the unseen and the eternal truth about Jesus, part of that mystery. And I remember the day I was saved, many years ago. But as I was listening to the minister speak that morning about Jesus Christ, I, being a very much just a seen and temporal person, was thinking in my mind something like this. Well, how could that mean anything to me? I'm living today, and he's talking about someone that lived uh, to round it off 2,000 years ago. Now, what could anyone else living 2,000 years ago mean to me today? Why should this person mean anything to me living today? And then to go on to embrace the other idea that was coming along, this person who lived 2,000 years ago can take away your sins. I said, how can that be? See, that doesn't make any sense to what we would call the rational mind. You see, if you never get beyond that, you never would trust Jesus as your Savior. But then, the, see, someone that I didn't know anything at all about, the Holy Spirit, was also involved in that little process I was going through that morning. And the Holy Spirit was bearing upon my spirit the reality of what I was hearing with my ear and it was like the Holy Spirit, Spirit was saying to me, but it's true, but it's true, but it's true. So in the, you might say, in the twinkling of an eye, in, in just a few minutes' time as I stood there in the worship service that particular day, I transferred my attention and my faith from the seen and temporal Jesus, whom I didn't doubt, 
but who had no real Im meaning or impact upon my life. I transferred my attention from the seen and temporal Jesus to the unseen and the eternal reality of that Jesus. He was, he was God's Son. He was my Savior. He could take away my sins. And you know something? I was saved. I was saved. And in the succeeding weeks that followed, the Holy Spirit continued to convince me of that fact. I am saved, I am saved, I am saved. And it wasn't many weeks or months until re regardless of what might crop up from the past, I still knew within myself, I am saved. Now, I didn't make that happen. It was the Holy Spirit, the teaching Spirit of God, who made me not only just conscious of, but convinced of that fact. Now, we've been looking at 1 Corinthians 2, and I haven't forgotten it. If you still got your Bible open there before you, look at verse 11. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? See, the root basis of life is not just soul and body. The center of life is spirit. And what Paul is telling these people, if you notice your Bible again, look at it, the real knower of a human being is not his brain, but his spirit. His spirit. Now, to jump over a fact, Paul goes on to say, Now we have received this spirit by which, which is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So, we have a spirit in us that can know. When we trust Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, we got the person. The Spirit of God came and took up residence within us. And He knows the things of God. Remember verse 10, the deep things of God? Who knows the deep things of God? Well, Paul answers that question if you look again at verse 11. Even so, no one knows the things of God except God the Spirit of God. I remember a few years ago and looking at that, and I'd looked at this section many, many times, but that little sentence that I just read kind of came alive to me, and in something of a humorous way to me. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. And I was thinking, well, gee whiz. Within a year after I got saved, I went away to a Christian's college, and I majored in Bible. And I was already called to preach, and I went away to a seminary to study the Scripture and study and uh, to know about God and all the things of the church and all the uh, other things about Christian education that were offered there. And after those uh, years in college and years in seminary, put them together, they would make seven years. And I said, you know, some, I ought to have a good grip on God. And then uh, that's when I smile because, you see, that sentence says, no one knows God but God. And I'd spent seven years trying to know God. And what I'd really come out with was information about God. The only thing I really knew about God was what I'd come to know about God the day I got saved. That was, he had died for me. I had trusted him as my Savior, and I knew my sins were forgiven. The rest of my education experience had just helped me to accumulate facts about God. Now, I want to ask you a question. What do you really know, and what do you know about this subject we're talking about, Christ in you, the hope of glory? What is it you know? Because what you know is mixed with you and that spiritual reality. What you know about is mental, and they're just facts. And the end result is this. They will not make you able to live the life. If anything, they'll produce more frustration in your life because they're the demands, they're the commands, they're the ought to's, they're the ought not to's, they're the should's, they're the should not's, and there's somebody in you wanting to do that, but you think it's you, so you're out trying to live this life, and trying not to live that life, and the only thing that's coming back to you is frustration and disappointment. And you're saying, but look how much I know. No, I say you, maybe you know very little. Maybe you know about a lot. 
The only thing you know in this restricted realm of spiritual reality that we're talking about, the only thing you know is what you know or in you has taught you. That's why this realm is so important. And in a way, that's why it's out of our control. I can't make the Holy Spirit teach me. I can be open and willing and responsive to what the Holy Spirit does teach me. But there's no real solid connection between what I know about and what the Holy Spirit will teach me. He will teach me according to his own schedule. He will teach me according to my readiness to receive, which may not be in flowing with what I think I'm ready to receive or when I'm ready to receive it. He has his own schedule. Now, Paul isn't the only one to discuss this, and I think I want to take just a minute to take you back with me to the 16th chapter of John's Gospel. Listen to Jesus. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So, you see, I'm not going to guide myself into all truth by studying the subject of God. The Spirit of God is going to guide me into all truth. And he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Now, listen, this is the 14th verse. He will glorify me. Now, if you're looking that up, let me give it to you. The 16th chapter of John, verses 13, 14, and 15. And this is what Jesus said. He, the Spirit, will glorify me. Jesus. And he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So you see, even Jesus said that he is going to impart to us a spiritual being, not just a, an ethereal kind of spirituality out here, but a spiritual being, the third person of the Trinity, who will have the responsibility of teaching us about God. Now, why do I say God? Because Jesus said about me and the Father. Jesus said in another place, the Father and I will come and take up our boat in you. And here he's saying, I will send the Spirit to you. In us. He's going to send the Spirit in us. He's coming to live in us. The Father lives in us. My goodness. That's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit resident in us with the Spirit's responsibility to be our teacher, which is exactly what Paul had said over here. The Spirit is our teacher. He brings the true knowing about spiritual realities. Okay. Now, there's another, just another verse of Scripture that I want to read to you, and this is in Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Now, Paul puts it in the form of a question. Listen, don't you know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Do you? Well, let's put it in the statement. I am the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in me. Oh. Well, now, let me ask you a question. Then where is the place where my interests should go? In the externals of religion? In the externals of study? Regardless of the importance, I'm not saying they're not important to have their place. I'm saying, where should my priority be? Paul says it should be in you. In you. The edification and the upbuilding of the Spirit isn't going to be in externals. It's going to be within. The development of the spiritual life will be within. And you see, as I said to you in a very short introduction, most of us involved with the sharing of the truth of Christ in you, the hope of glory, have come from a background where the total emphasis that we had was Christ died for you. Now it's up to you to live the life. Christ died for you. Now it's up to you to live the life. Now I hope you can see this on the blackboard. This is what, I'm going to draw a little line, and this is, to, to illustrate what kind of a life that produced in me. When I draw that little roller coaster line and I have a crowd with me, and maybe you've got a group there, there's usually somebody that has a, a, a knowing smile break across their face and they say, you know, that was my life. I'm here to tell you 
I'm here to tell you that was my life. Up and down and up and down, up and down. There were times I was exhilarated about God. There were times when I was angry at God. There were times when I was excited about the faith or my faith. There were times I was depressed about the whole thing. And I began to say to myself, you know, uh, and I mean this with tongue in cheek, it was easier being lost. This thing of trying to be a Christian is the hardest thing I ever got into in my life, and this is called the good news. You can keep it. You know, when I was lost, all I had to do was get up and put on my britches, and I was just as lost as a golf ball in high weeds. But after I got saved, I just it wasn't right just to get up and live. You had to quote so many verses before you could put your feet on the floor. You had to read so many passages of Scripture before you could eat your cereal. You had to pray before every meal. You had to be sure you did this, you did that, you did this, you didn't say this, you didn't do that, and you didn't do what you used to do before. And by the time I got to bed at night, I was absolutely exhausted with trying to be a Christian. It says what I mean. It was easy to be lost. Now, you want me to believe that Jesus died for me and then put me on this roller coaster and he calls that the good news. You see why this is so important? There's a missing ingredient, if, if that's an appropriate way to say it. There's a missing emphasis in the presentation of the gospel. And it is this theme, the mystery of the gospel, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, you see, no one's going to see that with the seen and temporal life. It's impossible. It is hidden. It is spiritually revealed and spiritually known. And I say to lots of people, the three most important words you're ever going to say in this context are, Oh, I see. Somebody says to you, Well, what do you see? You say, Well, I can't explain it, but I see it. Well, tell me about it. Well, I, I just can't put it into words. And, you know, and if you've had what they've had, you understand them. If you have had that kind of a spiritual enlightenment or a revelation from God about something, you say, oh, isn't that one? I see that. But when you try to tell a friend about it, it kind of, as we say, loses in the translation, doesn't it? You just can't get it into the right words. You can't describe it. But you've experienced it, you see. You've experienced it. Now here we have this unseen and eternal and mysterious realm. And we're dependent upon the Holy Spirit. I, I, I don't think this will confuse us. We're dependent upon the Holy Spirit to bring the reality of the unseen and eternals to bear upon our human spirit so that we can become knowers. Now just another little illustration. It's been used for years. No one can improve upon it. It isn't my illustration, but it's worthy of repeating. See, what you are, what, has, what you know, what you experience has become you. So you can say about that, I am that. And the first time I heard this illustration, and like I said, it hasn't been improved upon, it was given like this. If you know how to cook, then you can say, I am a cook. Right? Now, that doesn't mean you cook perfectly every time. Or that everything you bake or prepare is uh, perfect, but you're still a cook. Because the art of cooking has become so much a part of you that you and the art of cooking are one, and the art of cooking has become enfleshed. It has taken on your person, and you express cooking. Take a profession. Take an electrician. Take a teacher. Once upon a time, in anyone's experience, those two professions would be outside. I want to become a teacher. I want to become an electrician. So you go and you learn the trade, or you go and you prepare to teach. And that information becomes a part of you, so much a part of you, that someone says, you, well, what do you do? You say, well, I'm a teacher. Or did the other person, well, what is it you do for a living? I am an electrician. Now, does that mean you're the perfect teacher? That the children just can't wait to get your class and they sit there wrapped and attentive and never throw any, uh, you know, never cause any confusion or throw a spitball if they still do that? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that. It means that the know-how of teaching is so much a part of you that it's become you. 
And the art of teaching is now enfleshed in you so that you can say, I am about that. Same thing with the electrician. I am an electrician. I am an enfleshed, I am an enfleshed knowledge of electricity so that I can express the knowledge of electricity and that makes me an electrician. Now, when, what does it mean then when we say I'm a Christian? Oh, in the book of Acts, chapter 11, there's a fairly long discourse here, but to put it in my words, uh, some Grecian people were being saved in Antioch. And the Jewish church of, of Jerusalem sent Barnabas to investigate. And he came and he saw the work that was going on there and he, was, he, he, he spoke and he taught and he was convinced that these people who had really come to know Jesus Christ. And I'm assuming this, because Paul and Barnabas had met in Jerusalem, that Paul must have shared with the body there, or the people he talked with, that he, he, he knew he had a commission to Gentiles. Now Barnabas, being that compassionate, understanding person that he was, left Antioch and went to Tarsus to find Paul because the uh, believing community of Jerusalem had uh, sent Paul away and he'd gone to Tarsus, to his hometown. So Barnabas found him and brought him back to Antioch. And then now I'm reading from chapter 11, verse 26. And when he had found him, that's Barnabas finding Paul, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. For a whole year they stayed with that one group of people, the size of the number we don't know, but he says it taught a great many people. And at the end of that time, these disciples said, our name should be Christian. I am a Christian. See, before they had been followers of the way, or they had been followers of the Nazarene, or they may, have, they may have had no particular name whatsoever. You see, after Paul had spent, Paul and Barnabas had spent this year with them teaching, they came to the conclusion that the proper name for them was Christian. Well, if my proper name over here is electrician, what does that mean? It means I have come, become so one with electricity that I can say I am an electrician. So what does it mean to say I am a Christian in the fullest context? Or it means more than I'm saved. It means I have become so one with Christ that I can say I am Christian. I am Christian. Now you see, if that, if the Holy Spirit causes you to hear something there. It might be this. Well, all of a sudden, this Jesus Christ is not just seated at the right hand of the Father in this unseen and eternal realm, waiting for the end of the age when he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. This Jesus Christ is not only seated with the Father, but somehow, mysteriously, he is resident in me. And the burden and the responsibility of trying to live the Christian life is off of me and becomes the responsibility of the only person who can live the Christian life. Who is the only person who can live the Christian life? Christ. Who will live the Christian life? Christ. Well, this is jumping way ahead, but what is the human part what is my part? What is my cooperation with him? Well, my cooperation with him is the same type of thing I was trying to do previously in my own strength. I wanted something to happen. I wanted my life to reflect Jesus Christ. I was trying to make it Christ-like. That's what I wanted to happen. Now, I still want that to happen. So I become willing Yielded might be the word. I'm, I'm, I, I become yielded. I am willing for the person who lives in me to live his life out through me. And here's another little interesting fact. At least it's interesting and it's a fact to me. 
that hidden life, unseen and eternal, resident in you, will come forth from you, and it will be as you. Years ago, in, a, in our Union Life get-togethers, we were talking, and it just kind of came out. We were talking about Christ dying for us, Christ being with us, Christ being in us. Those are great prepositions that we use. Christ died for me. He's with me. He's helping me. And he's in me. He's in me helping me. But you see, we said, you know, the, the, the word as does as much as we can humanly do with the English language to close the gap of separation. Say, for me, separation. He did something for me. With me would be like you listening to me. You're with me, but there's still separation. You're sitting there in the chair. I'm standing here. And with a great many believers in me, it's the right preposition. But the concept to them is still one of he's in me helping me to become something. So we said, as he is in me, coming forth as me. Now, let me just say, we have problems with that idea. Most people don't understand it because they conclude by listening with the brain that we're saying we're Jesus Christ. No. We're saying that this unseen and eternal indwelling one manifests himself in this world, in this seen and temporal world, as us. Now, is there any scriptural base for this? I'd have to say yes, but I don't know that you will accept it. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, where was the Father? He was hidden. He was internal. He was unseen. But if you were looking at Jesus, he was saying you're really looking at the Father. Now, what did he mean? If you could look past the human figure to the real person indwelling him, you would know that everything he says and everything he does comes forth from the Father. Now, he went on to say this. The works that I do, they're not my works. But the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. Well, you see, if I were part of Jesus' entourage, I would say, well, you know, but it sure looks like you're doing that. I just saw you, you know, do that. I just saw you uh, bring forth that food, or I just saw you heal the, that person. I just saw you do that. And what Jesus is, he's not denying that he was the means of it, but he is emphasizing to us what's the source of that activity. And the source of that activity wasn't him. It was the Father who dwelt in him. He said it, the words I speak, they're not my words. What does it mean? Those words don't have their point of origin with me. Those works don't have their point of origin with me. They have their point of origin with the person who is the real origin of me. So you see, the words and the works of the Father were coming out as Jesus. Now, I said a while ago, well, n no one would deny that. But you see, beloved, I'm saying to you that that's true of you. That's true of me. Paul called us all sons of God by faith. Now, not the Son of God, but sons of God by faith. And that means to me that the resident Christ in me and in you, I trust, has the same, will, will express himself in the same way that he expressed himself in Jesus, in works and words and actions and activities. And it will look like us and people will say, thank you for doing that for me. Because to them it looks like you were the source of that. And in the seen and temporal realm, you were. But you see, you know a deeper secret, just like Jesus. Yes, it does look like I did that, and I did. But the source of that life is the resident Father in me. You see, this life can be lived. It doesn't have to be this. Oh, this will go on. But you see, this won't be my point of reference anymore. This indwelling, unseen, and eternal Jesus Christ, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, 
Never changes, never has ups and downs. He can be my point of reference. He can be my beginning place. So you see, the line is very important. It separates the unseen and the eternal from the seen and temporal. But remember, I said there really isn't any such thing as a line. But you will probably find yourself in your daily activities saying, gee, I'm living below the line, which will mean what? I'm believing all this seen and temporal stuff about myself. And another time, someone may say to you, boy, that was from above the line. And that might be like someone's having a hard time or a difficult situation, and you might say, but God is at work in that. And the farthest thing that appears to be happening is that God is at work in that. And someone would say, boy, that's an unseen truth. God is at work in the midst of this mess. So you'll find yourself using the line over and over again. But remember, we're absolutely dependent on the Holy Spirit to bring us the revelation of who we truly are in God and who Christ is in us. Now we're going to take this theme and develop it a, a little more in our second uh, session, or second subject, we might say, which we're going to call uh, the cross.